asshole. This game is XCOM but more predictable and less frustrating. Well, I'm actually not doing it justice. Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden is a smaller scale title with tactical, turn-based combat very reminiscent of XCOM family of games. Players lead a group of mutants wandering through post-apocalyptic Earth, scavenging any useful remains of our civilization. The premise is already interesting, but let's see how well it's executed. This is the late review Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden. This review is based on 26 hours of gameplay, finishing the base game and DLC campaigns, tackling a couple of challenges on Stalker Trials mode. I have also acquired 49 out of 54 total achievements, which translates into 90% achievement completion. I also feel inclined to say that this is my first completed XCOM type game, before I just had the brief adventures with this kind of titles. So let's talk about mutants. This will be so cool if it will work. <laughs> That's good. The game focuses on a group of stalkers, mutants roaming the dangerous world in order to scavenge goods and scrap for people living in the Ark, one of the last bastions of humanity in this destroyed post-apocalyptic world. Ark is used as the central hub for upgrades, lore exposition and buying new stuff. You can't explore it, it's more like an interactive menu. When you are ready for an adventure, you gather a party of Max 3 characters and venture deep into the dangerous ominous zone. Exploration happens in real time, players control one of the mutants while the rest follows. You can collect some scrap and find helpful items such as guns or armor pieces. If you need new parts or accessories for your motorcycle, you don't have to hire mutant scavengers. You can just visit Zmotocyklowani.pl. Such a smooth segue, isn't it? This is not a paid promotion. Zmotocyklowani is my friend's business. We used to ride across Poland on our bikes and I just want to help. They are just spreading their wings and for now they are trading mainly in Poland. If you are watching this video months after release, there is a decent chance that they extended their range to the rest of EU. As an example, in those cold winter months we have right now, they sell heated grips. So if you are one of the crazy maniacs riding your bike during snowstorms, check their offer. You might find a really good bike. Ok, back to the game. Encountering enemies switches the game into turn-based combat mode. First important note, Mutant Year Zero places heavy focus on choosing your encounters. There are ways of sneaking around tougher opponents, as well as various options of eliminating single-stranded foes. This way, you can make an encounter way more manageable. The first thing you should do is scout the area and look at the patrol patterns. There is usually at least one or two enemies who tend to go too far and can be silently picked up. Let's see. Police bot. Okay. We go. Okay. Let's eliminate it first. This is the game also gives players a lot of options when using covers. There is a strong defensive incentive for hiding behind full covers as opposed to partial covers. The same goes for high ground advantage as not only it makes you harder to being hit, but it also increases your accuracy and damage if your mutant uses certain passives. Then parts of the terrain can be destroyed, either by the enemies or by you. The changing landscape adds dynamism into encounters. Mutant Year Zero foregoes the chaotic RNG-based mechanics of XCOM. Hit chances are dealt in quarters, 25%, 50%, 75% or 100% chance to hit the enemy. It makes the system more predictable and manageable. With a strong setup and planning, you can ensure a decent hit rate for your team. 
As you'll progress through the story, unlock stronger weapons and passives, the chances of your mutants dealing critical damage will also increase. Enemy variety is decent for a game that takes about 15-17 hours to complete. Players will learn to play around hulking tanks, immune to Bormin's charge stun. They will have to plan the engagements around enemies throwing molotov cocktails, disabling strong psychics before they'll be able to dish too much chaos. Foes can be split into two categories, robots and humanoids. Playing around them introduces various challenges. Seed of Evil DLC only adds more to the system as it introduces a new breed of enemies. Every combat encounter feels like a puzzle, a chess match of sorts. First you take out the excessive, stranded pieces from the board. Then you have to figure out the best way to engage the core of enemy force, disable or weaken the biggest threats. It allows for great strategizing options. It's gonna be big. Oh, this is big. I can see already someone wandering there. Okay, show me. Who's gonna come? So we cannot destroy this person. Holy shit! Gameplay is strong, rarely frustrating. You reap what you sow. Your team helps you in achieving success. Each mutant has a different set of abilities. Some skills are available to more than one person, but each member has at least one signature ability specific only to them. Bormin is your tank. He can charge at enemies, stunning them for two turns. Ducks can use camouflage and hide until he gets the best position to dish massive amounts of damage. Magnus can possess enemies or use chain lightning. Team compositions create options. Each member has to pick a loadout of one major mutation, one minor mutation and a passive. Every weapon in the game is based mostly around 5 stats. Damage, critical damage, critical chance, ammunition and range. Then there is the additional factor of some weapons being silent so they don't alert nearby foes when you get rid of stranded opponents. It's a decent system but it quickly reveals one weakness. Weapons are not very varied. In base game we can only use 3 silent weapons. Then the main difference between shotgun and a rifle is the range and ammo count. It's strictly personal but I would really like to have a system a little bit deeper. You know, shotguns which could hit two enemies standing right next to each other if you took the risk and stood close to them. A rifle with an additional 50% chance of shooting another round in the same turn. Sure, it would go against streamlining RNG which is at the base of mutant's game design, but just imagine, just one weapon class offering this high risk, high reward, chaotic playstyle. And yes, I remember that some weapons can destroy covers, but at the end of the story there is no reason to pick a shotgun over the strongest rifle. You just equip everyone with the strongest weapons, not taking into account if it's a sniper rifle, grenade launcher or who knows what else. The same goes for upgrading your guns, there are very few types of attachments. They can offer meaningful upgrades, but most weapons will end up with similar gear. Then you could introduce more passives, a mutant specializing in handguns or shotguns or rifles. The current abilities and passives are decent, they definitely create an interesting highly tactical combat environment, but there could be more depth to the gunplay. That's my only grab with this system. Now, Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden makes a really strong statement when it comes to gaming. Difficulty creates experience. What do I mean by that? Well, in Mutant Year Zero, developers give players choices when it comes to difficulty settings. First of all, there are medium, hard and very hard levels, with very hard being an intended experience. Then there is an Iron Mutant mode which is just this unforgiving mode without manual saves coming. Once your teammate dies, it's permanent. If you'll combine it with very hard difficulty setting, then you have my respect. Developers allowed players to change difficulty setting during their playthroughs. So, as a fan of challenging content, I started my adventure on very hard, but then I grew tired of it and changed difficulty multiple times. Playing the whole DLC on medium just because I wanted to get the achievement for not using any medkits in it. And it made me notice something. You see, outside of obvious stronger enemy attacks and inflated health pools, those harder difficulty settings add one very crucial change. On medium, your team gets their whole health back after combat. On hard, they get half of their life pools back. On very hard, 
there is no health gained back, which means that not taking damage and using medkits becomes invaluable. Very hard difficulty creates this extremely scrappy, tense experience. Each part of scrap and salvage counts. Each upgrade feels massive. Skipping stronger enemies might be mandatory. You have to carefully plan using any of your inventory and it hurts. Throwing a grenade might help you win one fight, but it means that you will lack it until you acquire a new one. It's the best way to experience the game. I fully agree with its creators. Yet, I resigned from it for a sizable portion of my adventure. It felt too daunting. Mutant Year Zero doesn't respawn enemies, but it also doesn't respawn loot, so once you find yourself out of medkits and options to buy new ones, you are screwed. That's why I opted for easier difficulty and let me admit, yes, the game gets more approachable, but it loses this immersive factor of fighting for every piece of scrap, every item, every single upgrade. It hurts the overall feel of the world. Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden is one of the best examples how difficulty setting can change players' reception of the game. As you can tell, Mutant Year Zero doesn't offer any strong graphic performance. Visuals are basic and quite mediocre, even taking into account that this game was released back in 2018. Explorable areas are rather small, offering some leeway in terms of exploration, but not too much. Character models look outdated, especially mutants. You can notice that sometimes during conversations when camera closes on them. Enemies look a little bit better. I would describe music and sound work in the game as basic. It holds to an industry standard but does not excel at anything. Music combines the style of 80s sci-fi synth-based themes with more modern synthwave. It creates a very characteristic soundtrack which perfectly complements this weird world of walking pigs and foxes. Voice actors did actually a good job. Mormon's rough voice narrating through the cutscenes adds flavor to the events happening on screen. Magnus tells his tale. Him and Hammond were ambushed by the Nova sect. Magnus' soft, almost whispering remarks adds to the mystery of his character. And of course Big Khan, with his commanding voice lines reinforcing the strength of his character. Shut the fuck up. What are you saying to me? You're saying I'm like a bad person. You were an asshole then and you're an asshole now, so... Yeah, voice actors did good. In general, the game works well. I haven't encountered any crashes. The performance is stable. Few occasional bugs can happen. The most common are glitches in movement where a character instead of switching position freezes in place but after a couple of seconds teleports to selected position. So it doesn't hurt the experience. Outside of that few visual glitches can happen. Ah, and developers didn't take into account some potential obstacles during shooting animation. As long as the calculation is correct and your bullets hit the enemy, then it's not a problem if you have to shoot through your comrade or a wall. Things like that happen pretty often in the game. It wasn't a problem for me, but I guess there will be people who might strongly dislike it. Does that hurt? Mutant Year Zero's story is surprisingly good. Well, it's not anything groundbreaking, but it's competently written and executed. I would lie to you if I said that I haven't predicted some plot points, but still, I like the overall narrative. The main star here is the lore, not the actual in-game story. I was just impressed at this take on post-apocalyptic world. Ghouls who evolved from people forced into never-ending combat. Machines malfunctioning, turning against their creators. Mutants scavenging the wilds for resources and gaining knowledge about our civilization, which they call as the Ancients. You see, in Mutant Year Zero, humanity does not have any actual information about previous civilization. You know, our current civilization. I heard of these before. Never saw them. Weird how they're all connected. They got wheels. A lot of them. These things moved? Something's not they right. just research the remnants of our heritage or other artifacts that they find and speculate. Those speculations are used as a humorous breaks from this depressive, dangerous, post-apocalyptic reality as they are oblivious to the true purpose of the objects. This way a boombox becomes a bomb. Look at this beauty. 
the ancients left a lot of ugly junk behind, but once in a while you see something like this. Wonder what these buttons are for. I wouldn't touch it if I were you. I'm not kidding around. Lay off the buttons. What's up your butt? That's a bomb, all right. They used to call it a boom box. Touch that red button, and it goes boom. Toaster becomes an ancient hand hitter. A Rubik Cube becomes a complicated container for the most dangerous weapon in the ancient world. Goddess of hunger. A model of an ancient. Or maybe a proto-mutant. Look at those painfully thin legs. It's funny how they speculate and mischaracterize every mundane object. You could say that writers overplayed a little bit, but mutants' theories add another layer of reward to the collectible artifact hunt. Players are curious how will they mischaracterize another object. I liked it. Later. There's instructions to use this on somebody who's lying down. Maybe something to aid sleep or to relax. My main problem with the story is the hollowness of characters. In the Ark there are four interactable NPCs. The Elder, who is the leader of people in the Ark, is just an exposition spouter. Other NPCs offer some remarks from time to time. They might help to flesh out the world a little bit, but are very limited in terms of any personality traits. Our team of mutants first a little bit better in this regard. Each one of them has some general characteristics and personality traits. Dax is more charismatic and sarcastic. Bormin is the rough group leader, first blindly obeying Elder's orders, then later dares to free his curiosity. Still, there is hardly any focus given to personal characteristics of any given character. Instead, they are treated as a collective. Players discover their past, but outside of Bormin narrating the story, it's hard to see any distinct change within other mutants. The plot ends abruptly giving answers to some questions, but leaving some other narrative threads unresolved. This is where DLC steps in. It is you. The legendary stock of Big Khan. You left the Ark a long time ago to wander the zone. Thought you were dead. Alive and kicking, stalkers. It's been a long time, hasn't it? Seed of Evil is the singular piece of downloadable content for Mutant Year Zero. It picks up right after the end of the base game. So, first of all, there are three ways of engaging with it. The recommended way is to finish the main campaign, then after credits it will play out automatically. Second way, as long as your party will meet the level requirements, you can visit the first zone of the expansion. It's not ideal as the events happening there are direct continuation to the culminating point of the base game. The last way of launching the DLC is just accessing it through the menu. This way you will start it with leveled up team, but they will lack some of the inventory accessible from the base game. Seed of Evil offers a sizable amount of content. Some of it might invite players to revisit old zones, but there are also new zones waiting to be explored. Players can unlock new character, the tall moose mutant called Big Can. He can strengthen the team in new ways as he gains access to new abilities. Big Khan is not the only one to get new skills though. Other mutants can upgrade some of their signature abilities. Selma can turn enemies into cover. Dax can stay in camouflage as long as he kills an enemy each turn. Seed of Evil offers also new enemies and new gear. It offers new challenges to tackle. Plot of the DLC tries to resolve some narrative threads from the base game, but it does that poorly, clearly leaving some space for a sequel. Instead, it focuses on a new mysterious threat. The storyline is pretty good and I really liked it. Overall, Seal of Evil DLC adds about 10 more hours of gameplay, new enemies, new equipment and especially new team member who combined with enhanced abilities create a fresh spin on combat experience. In my opinion, it's a strong offering. This is the part where I am going to check a portion of most recent Steam reviews for the game. Any number between 100 and 200 should be fine to give me a good view of other players' sentiments about Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden. First surprising observation. Game sits at a score of 90% positive reviews out of 11,500 user reviews. That's a really high score. Most reviews praise Mutant Year Zero's approach to tactical XCOM-like gameplay. Adding stealth into the mix seems to resonate well with fans. 
reviewers to their liking to the world, humor and characters. As I said, the lore of this world strongly enriches it. It seems like the game would be a perfect fit for an XCOM lovers out there. Some reviewers like the one in here notice the intricate references to the 80s music in soundtrack. Negative opinions mainly focus on one thing, the tedium of the forced stealth. You see, while combat is highly tactical, the game forces players to eliminate singled out enemies before engaging bigger groups. This reviewer got me thinking. Through hard reliance on sneaking, Mutant Year Zero actually reduces players' freedom. Engaging enemies in open warfare is unreliable. I do not take it as a negative though. This is the game's core DNA. It's a stealth strategy game. And it makes sense in a highly desolate, bleak, post-apocalyptic world. Maybe the most important thing in here is to inform potential consumers that the game relies highly on stealth. Which I guess they did. This reviewer also disliked the story and called it bland. I have to disagree with them on this one, as in my opinion the approach to the story and lore helps to distinguish this title from other similar ones. But to each their own. I'm entitled to my opinion, Gamer X is entitled to theirs. Which is fine, that's how it should be. And here we have another negative review also disliking the heavy reliability on stealth. I guess it can get kinda tedious towards later stages of the game as you always have to scout the whole area trying to kill stranded ghouls. But this is what made it great for me. This model awards patience and careful planning. I already compared it to chess and puzzle. Now I will compare it to Jenga. You carefully remove single pieces trying not to alert the group. Only that in this game you later want to collapse the tower in one swift strike after weakening it from each side. Mutant Year Zero forces a specific playstyle. It's true, but I adore this playstyle. Scrapper dies. So we have time, and there's a mad bot. No, I killed him. Flesh wound, I think. I don't so know. That's all. He's the last one. What you got? Only done. Okay, achievement section. Mutant Year Zero includes 54 achievements. Right off the bat, completionists need to know that in order to get 100%, they have to own Seed of Evil DLC. Another important note, there are trophies related to difficulty setting. So, let's start with those. Base game has three of those achievements, all of them required to complete the game on Iron Mutant mode. Then it just gets gradually harder. Complete the game on Iron Mutant on very hard difficulty and do the same, but do not lose any character. When it comes to DLC, it's easier, as the game asks you to complete the DLC on Iron Mutant mode. So you can do it even on normal difficulty setting. I think this is the right place to tell you that Seed of Evil also has a trophy rewarded for completing the whole DLC without using a medkit once. This is a cool one because even on easy difficulty it forces players to carefully pick their engagements. And I wonder if it's even doable on harder difficulties. Now the Iron Mutant challenges are the only ones that I haven't obtained and they void the final achievement awarded for getting all achievements. The rest of trophies can be unlocked during a single playthrough. First of all my advice, create couple of checkpoint saves during your adventures. Enemies do not respawn, so it might be beneficial to replay a fight or two in order to get couple of skill related achievements. They are tied to killing enemies in certain ways, or using a skill specific amount of times. For example, there are certain stages where it's much easier to kill an enemy by throwing them from heights. You can also save before an encounter and redo it to farm skills usage and skill kills. I did it with possession skill. Look. We will start, but I want puppeteer. Possess 10 enemies with puppeteer. Will it work, puppeteer? Ooh, this is an AoE. One. And he is. Okay, but let's see. That's one puppeteer. Load.
and it works. <laughs> Other than that, there are also clear-related achievements, but if you are going to clear whole maps, then you should get all of them. The same goes for additional encounters. Now, the checkpoint saves might also help you, because there are a couple of skippable achievements. For example, in the lair of the Horned Devil, there is a big robot, Mimir Z600. You can reprogram it before the fight to get additional achievement. There is also a choice given to the player in the zone called Castle of Light, the right choice achievement-wise is to keep the key for yourself and open the forbidden door. It also ties to collectibles as there is an achievement for getting all of the artifacts. If you won't unlock forbidden zone in Castle of Light, you will be locked out of one achievement. In the lair of the Horned Devil, you actually have to allow enemies to activate the big robot in order to be able to unlock its artifact. So that's why leaving a couple of extra saves during different stages of your journey might be beneficial. DLC offers new trophies. Skill-related ones are easy to get. It extends the game challenge when it comes to collectibles. Seed of Evil asks players to collect every note in the game. There are almost 40 of those. Players have to collect notes from the base game as well as the ones from the DLC zones. Fortunately, they are kinda easy to find as they have this yellow glow around them. Then there's the task of collecting every type of hat. There are 13 in total. This achievement might be buggy. If you have 13 different hats, then simply reload your game and it should pop up. Bushwhacker offers a new challenge. Players have to visit zones from the base game and find 5 hidden publications. They are very well hidden. There is a sound playing once you find one, but the tricky thing is that they are hidden in the bushes with no way of spotting them. The easiest way to get all of those secrets is to just use the internet. Keep in mind that you have to stand on the right spot for the publication to pop up. The trigger area is really small. Also, Seed of Evil has those two other secret achievements. One is obtained for unlocking a secret room in the first DLC zone, Mausoleum of Suburbia. The key to the room is in the same zone. Northern Exposure is awarded for staying for about 2 minutes under bus stop while Big Khan is in your party. Any of the bus stops at the start of the last zone counts. In general, most of the achievements in the game are pretty easy. They do not require a lot of time if you are not going for 100%. If you want to get full completion, then Iron Mode on very hard difficulty is going to be one hell of a ride. This is a smaller scale title, taking the best elements out of tactical XCOM-like games, mixing it with stealth and greatly decreasing frustration linked to the genre. Mutant Year Zero chooses sustainability in exchange for crazy random chance events. There is still a decent deal of RNG in the game, but it's more manageable. Players take control over a team of charismatic mutants roaming post-apocalyptic Earth, each one of them with their own skill tree and specialities. The story of the game is surprisingly good, with the overall lore of the game being a breath of fresh air. There is a decent amount of humor, as mutants are oblivious to the remains of our civilization and mischaracterize some of the most mundane objects. Graphics are mediocre, but the gameplay is very solid. Variety of skills and weapons combined with a destructible environment allows for a great dose of strategy and tactical decision making during encounters. Unfortunately, I personally found it to be a little bit too simplistic in terms of depth. After a while you realize that weapons aren't that different from each other, some mutant abilities overlap. For a game that takes about 16 hours to complete plus 10 gained from DLC, it's definitely enough, but it represents a wasted potential. The difficulty in this game matters as it can dramatically change your experience. The intended, very hard difficulty setting creates an immersive yet extremely challenging adventure. It adds an additional layer to the game. This is definitely a very good product. While I cannot fully recommend it, I think it adds enough value to the genre to be treated with respect. Thank you for watching this video till the end. If you liked it, then hit thumbs up, maybe leave a comment and subscribe for more content. If you didn't like it, then by all means, let me know what you didn't enjoy. My question to you after this video is, 
How much RNG in this type of games do you consider as bearable? So that's all from me. Bye.